Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar today. Uh, we have um, a micro-learning webinar today, which will be some good information that we're going to receive. Uh, I'm Sharita Howard. The um, back, I'll be handling the back end or the technical side of the webinar. So if you are having any technical uh, problems, you can't see something or there's something that's not clear, you can send me a message via chat to the webinar host. And, or send me an email to um, vpmarcom at tdhouston.org, and um, I'll try to help you get you back into the webinar. Also, during the webinar, if you have a question, if you're familiar with the questions panel, you can place your question there, or you can simply type it in the chat box, and we will uh, answer those questions as they come up. If the question is not answered, at the end, there will be um, a brief Q&A session where we can address those questions at that time. And with that information, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Janet, and she's going to introduce our uh, speaker for today. All right, good afternoon, everybody. And we are excited. We have Summer Sella Monson with us, who is the Chief Learning Officer for Gravo. She is in charge of the micro learning content and professional service capability space. And she has also won gold in Brandon Hall's 2017 Emerging Star Awards. She's had some work within the healthcare space as well as public education. And she is a member of ATD. International Conference and Expo Program Advisory Committee. We are excited because micro learning, we know, is a hot topic right now. So she is going to share with us all about micro learning. Summer, thanks for being with us, and it's all yours. Thank you so much, Janet. Uh, this is my pleasure. Uh, I love doing webinars. I love talking about the real work and getting down to business as an L&D practitioner. Um, I have lit up my webcam just because I feel like there's something valuable in being able to see a face and uh, being able to see expression as, as I go through this, uh, but don't let that distract you from, from the focus. Today, we're going to be talking about microlearning as the modern strategy for the modern workplace. Uh, lots of words that we're hearing a lot of, right? Microlearning. I mean, my goodness, everybody's talking about it. And uh, for my part, and for Grovo especially, we see microlearning as strategic. We see it as a response to what's happening in the workplace that we know well. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit about how you might make that a reality in your workplace. So to begin, I'd like to paint a picture. I'd like to paint a picture from the data that we all know to be true. We read the Burson reports. We look at what ATD is saying. Uh, we look at the McKinsey's and the Gardeners of the world, and we've seen a lot of data that suggests our traditional organizations and organizational structures are shifting. And this comes at us from different places, but today I want to focus on two critical data points that really paint the picture of the modern workplace and hopefully will catalyze that need to identify and implement a new strategy in response to this. So at the outset, we're seeing the collapse of typical hierarchical structures. And what this means is, is a couple different things. One, we're asking our employees to do more with less. We are asking them to influence without authority, to reach across teams, to uh, learn to be agile, to learn to be multifaceted. And these requests and these expectations require upskilling that we may not be ready to administer. The second thing this means is the way we think about learning and its distribution in our organizations should shift. If we are still assuming that the way we develop learning adheres to uh, more traditional waterfall approaches, the ADDIE model, which we all love, but let's face it, it takes a long time to get ready to deploy. If we're relying on those things, then we might miss the opportunity to really make change in our organization. So let's get into this. I see L&D's role as increasingly complex, but ultimately strategic. 
And I realize a lot of this may be aspirational for you, depending on where you are and, and what organization you're in. Um, I was sharing with Janet, I spent uh, Tuesday in Dallas with uh, 47 local L&D practitioners, and we were talking about building microlearning strategies. And one of the most common points of feedback I hear is, I am tasked with you know, simple kind of objectives, get an LMS, centralize the learning, respond to compliance. It's very perfunctory check the box approaches. And as L&D practitioners, it can be hard to elevate that conversation and to move it into more of a strategic dialogue. So let's look at some of these data points that are painting this picture around our workforce and our workplace and see how we might look at microlearning as an opportunity there. Um, one of the biggest um, data points I wanna focus on, is that I wanna focus on too, is the, the surge of the millennials. Now, don't worry, I'm not gonna sidetrack us with a big conversation about generational differences in the workplace. I'm not into that. But there is data to support that by 2020, roughly 50% of our businesses will be millennials. Now, these are folks that were born roughly between 1980 and 2000, okay? Lots of discussion around, oh, they are tech savvy. I argue they're tech dependent, uh, which is a bit different. But bottom line, there are two pieces of information that are most critical to this. As millennials start moving into that majority share of the, of the workplace, they place a high premium on learning. A recent internet study of, um, it pulled around 5,000 millennials around businesses in the US showed that on average, 25% of millennials rank learning opportunities higher than a 401k plan. 8% said, hey, I would rather have meaningful learning rather than a cash bonus. Now, I realize that data might cue some eye rolls, but I think the trend is there this group is a learning culture. And I think part of that is because from their insurgence into the workplace, they have grown up in an age where they have data at their fingertips. Now, I'm a Gen Xer, okay? I sent my first email in college and it was a really big deal. I got my first cell phone after grad school. But this group from a very young age was used to sourcing and identifying data for themselves. So when they come into a workplace that has much more rigid, um, kind of formalized learning processes, they tend to bump up against those barricades. And they say, I need to have learning at my fingertips. For example, two weekends ago, I was sitting in my house and I heard this crazy noise coming from my kitchen. And I realized the ice machine in my freezer was breaking. It was, it was just dying a very slow death. So there were two options for what I could have done. One, I could have gone to the uh, phone book if they make those anymore or find a number for a repairman. Or two, which is what I opted to do, I went on YouTube and I searched in broken ice machine repair. And I quickly scanned through the top videos, filtered it by the highest rated, shortest amount, best reviews, and I watched that to see if I could do it myself. I believe we are living in an increasingly consumer-driven and learning-driven culture that has not yet permeated the workplace and millennials are driving this. The second data point that's most critical around this millennial population is their tenure in the workplace is dramatically shorter than the generations before, traditionals, baby boomers, or Gen Xers. They tend to stay two to five years, what research is showing, sometimes on the lower end, you have a few outliers on the higher, but that means we need to train them quickly, upskill them swiftly, so that they can get to competency faster. The second big piece of data I wanna talk about is um, some of you will remember, and actually put in the chat, if you remember this infographic from Burson by Deloitte, I think it came out towards the beginning of 2017 called The Modern Learner. Do you guys remember this one? And the finding was the modern, the modern learner, the modern employee has 1% of his or her time devoted to formal learning in a week. Give me a, a yes if you guys remember that. Yeah, there we go, someone remembers this. This was a startling finding. I, I'm assuming more of you guys uh, remember this. I'm not seeing the whole, whole boards light up, but it was a fascinating graphic put out by Burson by Deloitte. And as L&D practitioners, 
practitioners were sitting here going, oh my gosh, only 1% of formal learning. How on earth are we going to make that case? There's some nuances here. So I would say formal learning is largely secondary to informal learning on the job, peer-to-peer -peer learning. All that aside, the point is the competition for our employees' time is fierce and more intense than ever before, which means our job has to be more strategic. So let's look at this a little bit more. I see our employees as unprepared. Um, I don't think they're ready for what we're challenging them to do. And I don't think in general, these grand scale learning initiatives that we're creating are hitting their need. That's going to change the behavior that we need to drive business goals. Um, McKinsey just released a study a few months ago saying that 77% of the execs they work with, which we know McKinsey is a huge organization, have prioritized as the top 10 upskilling their employee based as up, upskilling their employee base as a result of automation and digitization they are seeing this movement in organizations we know companies are experimenting with business model innovation they're seeing what digital transformation can do for them and i know if we we're playing a buzzword game there's a lot of them but these are real words companies are changing fierce competition in the marketplace means they have to get better faster which means our employees have to get better, faster. So let's look at what the, what the fallout of this is. We know that they place a premium on learning. We know our employees expect learning opportunities. Uh, Degreed just put out a great study um, at the beginning of 2017, maybe the end of 16. They, um, they surveyed 500 um, individuals across businesses in the US and they asked them, on average, how much do you spend out of your own paycheck money for learning opportunities that directly help you with your job. And the um, average amount was $339. That's a significant amount on, uh, on higher ed expenses, on online courses, on those types of things. So we have data that supports that employees are looking for learning opportunities. And as practitioners, we have an opportunity to respond to that need. So let's get into it. Microlearning as a core component of your L&D strategy. What does this look like? Uh, how many of you guys, I'm gonna ask you to put in the chat again, and I'm hoping I can see this. Um, hoping I can see the, the chat with everyone. Tell me how many of you guys have heard the phrase microlearning in the past month, or someone has sent you uh, something about it, or your boss has asked you to look into it. How many of you, how many of you this is something that's trending? in your neck of the woods. And Janeth, I'll ask you to tell me if you're seeing stuff in chat, because I am not seeing anything. Uh, Summer, this is Sharita, and they are saying yes, but they're uh, putting it in as, as a question. So oh. yeah, that's why you're not, yeah. So, but they, they are responding and <laughs> They are all saying yes. One says, Brian said he just heard it yesterday. So <laughs> go find out what this micro learning is. I love it. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm not able to see the questions or the chat. So thanks for filling that in. Um, okay. If something comes up, please, please call my attention to it because I'm, uh, I'm missing that link. Thank you, Brian. I love that, that you just heard that yesterday. Yes, micro learning is trending. Um, if any of you guys were at the AT, ATD International Conference last year. Um, of course, that's where we heard it uh, in Atlanta when Tony Bingham uh, stood up and said, hey, microlearning is our, is our topic. Um, and we're gonna talk about that, which was a surprise to me. I, I sit on that uh, approval committee and we hadn't talked about it before, but clearly they have their fingers on the trends of what people are talking about. My challenge for you guys today is to elevate it beyond just a discussion of short content, which the time is implicit, but we'll get to that, but seeing it as a strategy. And when I talk about microlearning as a strategy, my challenge to L&D practitioners is, this has got to be a core component of your overall L&D strategy. There will always be room for in-person. There will always be room for retreats, for e-learning, for other classroom-based stuff. I believe learning as a strategy in general should be multifaceted. 
And I think based on your you know, company's budget and resources, go for it, mix it up. Um, but as a micro learning strategy, I like to think about this in three critical ways, what it looks like, and then we'll break it down on how to implement it. So when you think about micro learning as a strategy, remember, as we know as practitioners, but sometimes we forget in the implementation, real learning takes place in context. Um, as I've come up in learning over the past, oh, 15 years or so, I've seen, uh, I've seen some, some growth in this area. Early days of L&D, those of you that have been around for a while, maybe mid 90s, as we started to, uh, started to, to gain our footing as a, as a strategic partner, we, we based our value on the premise that we needed to remove employees from their workplace build learning around a classroom environment and then take them back to the workplace and somehow transfer would magically happen. Now, a lot of this was pre-digital tools that we have now or during the growth phase of digital tools, but we know from a learning theory perspective that that immediate transfer happens when they're able to apply it and when we can move memory from working to long-term. So real learning takes place in context and a micro-learning strategy means that you are feeding them learning opportunities within their workflows. Secondarily, I never want to underestimate the power of multimodal delivery, um, multiple ways to consume content, video, audio, rich text, images. Now, I will say I have seen some companies uh, go overboard on this. So I spent about six years as a, as a learning tech consultant, and I partnered with really big organizations. And what's fascinating to me is companies tend to apply their approach to uh, modality within learning. That is to say, for example, I worked with Microsoft and they place a high value on super high productive videos. And so it made sense that in the learning space, they would apply that same value. However, I am not of the belief that video or audio or other things must be highly produced or high quality in order to be impactful. I would say it needs to be authentic and relevant to the learning that you're giving them. I worked with a cell phone company, um, the, the largest cell phone group in Australia, and they were rolling out this massive learning strategy to all of their frontline employees on how they were going to sell the new cell phone plans, whatever. And they took the standpoint of, hey, instead of these overly produced videos that are, you know, people are touched up, they have beautiful makeup on, they're swell lighting, the obligatory plant in the background, and, you know, the stack of books of all the new learning stuff. Why don't we do webcam videos? And imagine this, a company that said, hey, we have our executives on board for this learning initiative. We have the key players on board. We're going to ask them to film themselves at their desks from their webcams and submit that as part of our video component for this micro learning strategy. And it worked because in that company, they valued the authenticity and they valued the buy-in more than they valued the production. The other piece I'll say about this multimodal that really gets me excited is the past couple years, I have seen practitioners move more and more towards the um, creation and deployment of audio as a validated, incredible form of learning and, and training delivery. Um, we are seven times more likely to, to, uh, res, uh, to retain what we hear in audio, and we have a seven times a longer tolerance for audio. So video, our cognitive load becomes overloaded really quickly. With audio, because it's just coming in, this part of our senses, we can tolerate more and we internalize more, um, which is why there's been this resurgence over the past couple of years in podcasts. Um, I, I just wanted to say, raise your hand if you listen to podcasts. I'm getting hooked on them. I can't stop because there's something so minimal about how much energy I have to contribute to it. And yet I always feel like I walk away with something meaningful. These types of multi multimodal deliveries increase positive learning emotions. Um, the research of Annie Murphy Paul, which is fantastic, that says, hey, there's academic emotions and then there's learner 
emotions and the positive learner emotions we want to capitalize on delight curiosity engagement and flow for you mindfulness folks flow is a big one so how do we move our virtual learners into that space of positive response to learning and then the final piece one of the one of the elements that i believe is core to the creation of micro learning content excuse me is um single concept learning when i build micro learning content with my team uh, grovo the micro learning company and i manage a team of content producers and we are the ones that scope and create and identify the trends and then build these micro lessons for that single concept when we focus learning distribution around a single concept or single behavior we give our employees an opportunity to deep dive into a topic to immediately apply skills and to really immerse themselves into that knowledge. We'll talk a little bit about the barriers to that in the strategy portion. So I wanna move now into kind of my three-part approach for a microlearning strategy. Um, it's always a little bizarre, you know, I'm talking to myself in my office and looking at my webcam, but I'd like to open it up to any questions you guys may have at this point before we transition to the next, place, uh, next phase. Please feel free to add those to the question box. So right now, I um, don't see any questions. Uh, someone may be uh, currently typing. I show Adolfo has his hand raised. Um, I'm going to unmute him and see if uh, if he has a question. Okay, Summer. Great. Sounds good. One second. Adolfo? No, sorry. That was just my way of indicating that yes, yes, I've seen micro learning. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay. Love it. Hands up. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm going to mute you uh, back. Awesome. Then, Sharita, I think I'm just going to move into the next part and we'll start talking about what a micro learning strategy looks like. Okay. Okay. So, three components to this. Um, the first step is kind of catchy. Think about it as start small. Uh, one of the learnings I've, I've carried with me over the years as a learning practitioner is oftentimes when I'm challenged to identify a new initiative in response to something we're seeing, I tend to over-architect it. And I think as learning and development professionals, on some level, we're, we're passionate about how learning can make change. And we just kind of get in there and over tool things um, and so by the time that we present our initiative or a plan to either you know vp of hr or executive team or however your company works there are so many moving parts that it gets overburdened and has a far less chance of taking off from the starting line so my challenge to you thinking of micro learning as a core component to your strategy is start small what is that critical pain point your company is experiencing that is holding you back from your goals, your North Star, your objectives as an organization? What is that employee behavior that isn't quite right, that isn't being resolved, that isn't being fixed? Um, Grovo recently partnered with um, Inter Intercontinental Hotel Group. Um, obviously really focused on customer service, on how they can communicate things at the person-to-person -person level. And what they found was that they were struggling with the amount of knowledge that the phone uh, customer service focus uh, persons had. So when individuals called the phone line, they were having hugely negative responses because the phone people could not keep up with the, with the level of questions that people um, were having for them. And so their micro learning strategy focused purely on what are the scenarios, what are the situations, what are the responses that we need to skill our customer care folks with in order to better respond in that moment. What they did not do was think about their micro learning strategy as, okay, if we're gonna focus on the customer care folks, then let's expand this training out to the 
in hotel group and let's further expand that to the offshore customer call center and then let's also roll it out in the corporate development and you know what while we're doing that why don't we also add training about influence and unconscious bias and so on and so forth they were very very targeted with that first step saying this is the pain point when people call our call center we do not have a fast enough or thorough enough response to their questions. And after data analysis, they realized those questions were basically one of 10 that they typically got. So let's focus this microlearning strategy on those 10 and go from there. The second piece um, I wanna challenge you guys with, and maybe this is an opportunity to respond to the chat as well, is have you validated that the pain point you are experiencing or the employee behavior that is subpar is the actual root cause. I talk with a lot of organizations that tend to build or architect learning around symptoms of something that is deeper. So type for me in the chat, what is your strategy to identify the root cause of a problem? What approach do you take to make sure you've really gotten to that pith? I'll pause for a second and see if anyone has any suggestions. And it's totally okay if nothing. Let me propose this one. If you've heard of the five wise strategy, Okay, made famous by Toyota, of course, with their lean method. Five whys is something that I want to challenge you to utilize next time you're at this step one. Five whys is something that forces you to ask questions back to the root cause of a problem. Um, lots of great guidance on this. Uh, Google five whys and you'll come up with some great stuff, but it's a Toyota method as part of their lean methodology. And five whys is really that opportunity to get to the root cause. So before you architect your strategy, you know that you're architecting around the actual problem, the actual behavior, um, the actual shortcoming. All right, so step one is start small. Oh, great response. Um, nice, we usually tie it all back to the fundamentals communication, customer service, customer service, and manager leadership. I love that, Brian. So it sounds like when you identify, you know, what behavior you want to improve, you're going back to your corporate goals. These are the three things that we value most. Therefore, this thing needs to align. I think that's hugely important for learning practitioners. We love to create learning just to create learning. <laughs> we forget our strategic role at the executive table, which is moving our company forward. So for you guys, communication, customer service, and manager leadership. I like that, manager leadership, that's awesome. All right, step two, stay focused. And this is not necessarily around your engagement, but more so around elbowing out all those competing priorities that come um, to the table as you're going to implement this microlearning strategy. Um, I call them the also rounds. So organizations that do this the best are able to target that pain point and identify a strategy to deploy that stays true to that initial problem and not keeping on other pieces. Um, I was recently working with one of our customers in New York and they manage, they manage a, a sports team. And they were talking about the challenge of when they finally have money and they finally have the ear of the executive team and they're able to deploy something, all these other departments come out of the woodwork and then want to heap on their components as well, things that they want to add to that strategy, add to that initiative. And it's been a big challenge for them to stay focused, as it were, um, not clouding the strategy with also rand but then also identifying and managing those competing strategies. Um, so here's my question for you guys, and Brian was, was Johnny on the spot for this one, so I'm gonna pick on the rest of you. What are the ways that you do this? Uh, feel free to raise your hand if you wanna verbally contribute, but I'm always interested in an L&D practitioner's toolkit around how do you manage the competing priorities that draw attention away from your strategy? What is your kind of 
elbowing technique when you get to that table and you want to gain alignment and keep focused on what you're working on. I'll pause for just a second and see if anyone would like to share. Charita, any hands coming up? I do have a question. I'm about to put it in the chat right now. Well, right. I have a comment. Yes. Uh, from Corrine. So let me just type her name here real quick. Uh, I hope I got that right. Ooh, wigs. I love that acronym, Corinne. That's <laughs> awesome. Wildly <laughs> important goals. Holy moly. Corinne, would you be willing to raise your hand and go off? Go off mute because I would love to hear your take on that. That that's a that's an awesome approach. Okay, Corinne, let me unmute you here. Hello, Corinne. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So I would love to take credit for that, but of course that comes from um, Stephen Covey. Uh, yes. <laughs> and. Um, for the, what do you call that, uh, four disciplines of execution. And so, you know, it, we have wildly important goals and then we have uh, from, I think it was built to last, um, big, hairy, audacious goals, which I mm -hmm. think are two different things. And that, you know, you, you have the big, hairy, audacious goal, the, the big stretch goals that are out there, but being able to identify what your, your extreme priorities are in, in this example in L&D and making sure that everything you do takes you closer to those priorities and that you can ask, so it's simply asking yourself, is this activity that I'm about to undertake going to take mm. me closer to or further away? Mm. I and love that, Corinne. Those, yeah, really understanding the, the opportunity costs. And if I, if I can follow up that question, have you found success with your you know, partners with other departments in your organization communicating that strategy, do you find that they they respect the approach or does it take more kind of constant communication to keep people aligned on those wildly important goals? Uh, well, since I'm the only person in my organization, <laughs> it's actually harder than you think because I have to keep myself aligned and not facing all these pretty different um, you know, opportunities that I might go on. And so, yes, I, I'm constantly re refining and, and making sure that I focus. And I also help my clients do that as well. Yes. I love that. Thank you for bringing up those, those wigs. I, I don't know if I can call them wigs. I always read it that way when I see it. That's, That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Corinne. You're welcome. Um, and Yolanda. Ooh, mission, vision and mission. Thank you for, for bringing that up. I, I worked seven years in healthcare, so, and it was nonprofit healthcare. And oh boy, if vision and mission were not critical to us. Uh, Yolanda, would you be willing to go off mute and just share a little bit maybe about how your company stays on target by focusing on vision and mission? Yolanda? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, well, my role is a little bit uh, more difficult. I'm in a technical area here at NASA. So I'm just dealing with uh, trying to gather some soft skill stuff for the, the technical engineers here in our group. So um, I've always believed in evaluation. So when we train astronauts here and we grade them, I make sure all of our objectives and training is focused on the, the evaluation that they would be evaluated on. Mm. But for the engineers, I'm, I'm, I would use the, our, our group's vision and mission to focus on that area for the group. So that's how I tend to um, fight for the things I need over here. <laughs> I love that. And working with an engineering population, I mean, I'm in a tech company, so I get that. There's, there's inherent challenges there. What, what strategies do you use to really communicate the importance of the vision and mission with your, your unique team? 
Well, right, right now, um, I have support from our, our manager um, to go ahead and look for soft skills training since that's something that the group uh, had said they, they wanted. Mm. And um, so basically, um, I, I don't really have to really fight for it. I just pretty much, you know, um, like right now, my manager gave me direction. I think he's looking more at um, situational leadership. So I'm going to start looking into that. But I'm also personally looking at other things that I feel the group is lacking as, as far as soft skills to bring to them. And I, when I look for those types of things, I keep looking at the vision and mission of this oh. group to make sure whatever I find falls in, in line with that. That way I really don't have to fight for it. Oh, I love that. So every step of the way, you're reorient, reorienting to this is the vision, this is the mission. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing, Yolanda. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. No problem. Awesome. I, I love I love hearing these things. Um, and the wildly important, important goals, focus on the vision and mission. I think these are things that we remember somewhere deep down in our tool chest. We know we have it. Um, but oftentimes, once we got the money and we're moving along with our strategy, it is so easy to uh, just get get a little lost. Um, so step three and the final step is kind of this this big part of it. And it's it's step three, but it's also something that I would challenge you to think about throughout your entire microlearning strategy deployment. And there's two major components to this. Um, the first is, focusing on that real-time knowledge transfer. Um, we want to avoid the Ebbinghaus uh, forgetting curve, right? That after employees get something by seven days, they've forgotten it. And the remedies are recall and repetition, all right? Giving them opportunities to apply, immediately getting back into work. One of the things we value so highly at Grovo, yes, we create off the shelf content, but because it's integrated in the work stream, you're not moving them mentally from the work they do to the learning they receive that helps them do the work they do. That immediate application is what emphasizes that transfer, which as l and practitioners is the gold, right? That's, that's what we want. Um, the second piece here has kind of been a, a little soapbox I've been getting on recently. Um, I did a, a webinar with the conference board in New York a couple months ago, um, resurrecting some of the very first articles that Peter Senge wrote around learning organizations and building learning cultures. And what fascinated me, I, I pulled up this article from 1990 about you know the competitive competitive advantage of learning cultures. Um, his famous quote in that is, over the long run, superior performance depends upon superior learning, okay? We know this to be true. We know this is a competitive advantage, but it is so picking hard to sell, and the ROI can be so challenging to get to. Um, this learning culture piece is something I'm focusing right on uh, right now myself. Um, I was hired about four months ago. And my challenge was as the CLO, not only to create our external strategy, but as a tech company to um, resurrect, create, nurture, catalyze, whatever verb you wanna use, a learning culture within our organization and working primarily with engineers and content creators, which my team is primarily English majors, liberal arts, storytellers, and then the rest of the company are product developers and engineers and code writers, vastly different groups of people. And the challenge has been, how do I think about a microlearning strategy that will help them not only do their jobs better, but build a cohesive and collaborative environment? We know that companies that embrace collaboration are more likely to be high, highly productive. They're quicker off the line. They're faster and go to market. Uh, Burson's been doing huge amounts of studies on this recently. For my part, I see microlearning as a strategy that is, should be a core component of your overarching strategy. And when you think about that, when you're able to interweave learning into the workflows of your employees, then maybe, just maybe, we'll be at this place where we can build a learning culture. 
And as a learning tech company, you would think that would be just inherent and obvious, but it always takes work and it's always challenging. Um, so that's kind of how I've been thinking about this, this strategy. Start small, stay focused, make it stick. I'm gonna move just to my last kind of challenge slide. Um, I'd like you to think about those opportunities within your organization to make microlearning a core component of your overarching learning strategy. How can you meet employees where they are? How can you deliver meaningful moments of learning that will change behaviors and ultimately drive business outcomes? So we're just at about uh, 40 after. I'm in mountain time here, 1140. Um, so I'd love to pause and open it up for Q&A. Uh, Sharita, if you will uh, help me facilitate that. Absolutely. Um, if you have a question and you'd like to um, actually um, voice your question, uh, raise your hand and I will unmute you or you can type it in uh, the question panel and I'll put it in the chat and Summer will be happy to address it. And special thanks out to uh, Corinne and Yolanda for jumping off mute and engaging. It's uh, as a practitioner and as a verbal person, it's hard sitting in a room by myself and not being able to see people. So thank you for, for chatting with me a little bit. <laughs> so I'm not seeing any questions yet. And Charita, we can make this um, deck available to people afterwards. Is that is that the plan? Yes, uh, the presentation is recorded and it will be available on the uh, APD website. Great. Oh, we have a question here. Let's see, Brian has a question. And I'm going to unmute you, Brian, so you can ask your question, if that's okay. Hi, so Brian? Brian Bean here. Hey, Brian. So my question actually is there's a lot of, you know, uh, sites that have free accounts or they have, you know, paid accounts that you can, you know, utilize for, let's say, a small group. Is there anything in particular, um, one better than the other, obviously, I'm, looking more for advice, you know, there's Zumo, those other things like Kahoot, stuff like that. Um, is there anything particular, obviously Grobo, but uh, um, just want to know your thoughts. Thoughts on when you talk about um, sites with free accounts, what is the what is the product that you're looking for and what is the problem you're trying to solve for? That's a very good question uh, to dive deeper into that. So let's say I have senior leaders that are needing some micro learning on communication or emotional intelligence and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. We obviously have our learning management system. However, um, they live in a mobile world to where they're getting on flights or they're getting on uh, you know, uh, trips and everything like that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say in this space, uh, companies are more and more going to that immediate um, mobile view. Right? I mean, that's obviously priority. Grovo, of course, does that. Um, as far as the, the micro learning focus, what I found is a lot of companies are either focusing on creating their own to tailor what they have, but um, formatting it in context of more of a multimodal short form delivery. Um, for our part, our emphasis is really that leadership, professional skills, um, influence without authority, unconscious bias, our specialty is microlearning content. Um, so that, of course, is there. I'm trying to think, um, you know, LinkedIn has really made huge strides in their learning platform, LinkedIn Learning. Um, I would not call it microlearning. I'd call it kind of expert curated learning that's available in a virtual right. format, um, which kind of solves a different challenge and you'd need kind mm -hmm. of that different focus for what people are looking for. Um, 
Yeah, that goes to the um, micro learning, such as the time management, um, you know, snippets of two minutes or uh, yeah. something with a um, uh, management uh, minutes with uh, Todd DeWitt, something like that. Um, yes. Those types of things you can utilize well. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I'd say the challenge with the time piece is so many practitioners talk about micro learning first in in context of its brevity right micro learning is short learning i would say that is implicit in the design whenever you do single concept and you're integrating in workflows time is always going to be a component because you want to maximize that that ability to stay focused on a lesson and the retention but for me and how we build learning time is a natural output of just expertly crafted micro learning we don't set out to say it must be less than three minutes. I feel like those are um, unnatural constraints to put on yourself. I think some topics and some um, some uh, avenues of, of interest may preclude longer points of study. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of different a lot of different um, opportunities out there. As I said, LinkedIn certainly has a lot of press. I wouldn't call it micro learning. Um, Grovo definitely differentiates as the micro learning provider. That is what we specialize in. Um, but yeah, I'm also happy to talk, talk offline, Brian, hit me up on LinkedIn and, and I'll, uh, pull my brain for some more thoughts for you. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Hey, my pleasure. Okay. Summer, there looks to be like, there is no more questions. Currently, and I don't okay. see anyone's hand raised. Okay. Great. Then I'm I'm happy to wrap up. We're a little bit early, but it will give you guys some time back on your uh, lunch break if that's acceptable to you. Yes, I, I looks like and and still, if someone has a question, even if she, Summer is doing her wrap up. Feel free to raise your hand uh, at any time and we can get that question in. Great, well, I will uh, just kind of follow my, my final couple seconds uh, in the spirit of micro learning. Look, I believe that the data we see now about the modern workplace requires us to think differently about learning and development strategies. And that's why micro learning strategies, it's not a buzzword, it's not the next flashy thing. It's the modern strategy for the modern workplace. Follow these three steps, identify the pain point, make sure it's the right one using the, uh, the, the root cause analysis of your choice. Stay focused, elbow out those competing priorities as uh, Yolanda and Corinne shared with us, focus on the vision and mission. What is the wildly important goal? And finally, stay focused, make it stick. Build that learning culture. Help your organization see the competitive advantage of being an organization that learns. Um, other than that, feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm a passionate practitioner in L&D, and I'd love to talk to you. Summer, thank you so much for your presentation to our group today. We have learned a lot. I hope everybody took notes. I took notes as well, and looking forward to implement the next phase for micro learning. Hope it works for you all as well with your different industries and your teams. And thanks for participating with us today. Everybody have a great day and have a great rest of the week. Bye-bye.